One of the greatest goals in my life as a fish nerd was to learn and take what I learned from university and try and save the world's oceans. Right? Pretty optimistic, I know. But my first job in Gabon had nothing to do with being a fish nerd. I was a skipper on board a patrol vessel and confronting illegal fisheries every single day and absolute dismal condition these poor fishermen live in on these vessels. I started to question what the science I was doing and believing in really meant. And I started grappling with the idea of like trying to conceptualize what these guys were going through and I started thinking more and more about illegal fishing and, and how it impacts everything. And my whole life I've been taught what defines a fish, when maybe I should be understanding what a fish represents, hopes, dreams, cultures, livelihoods, and the very reason these guys are living in horrific conditions on these fishing vessels. And then I started to think to myself, if I go out to measure another little fishy, is that really going to make a contribution to saving the world's oceans from some of today's challenges? And I don't think so. So as a fish nerd, what was I doing in Tanzania on the shores of East Africa, chasing bomb fishermen, criminal syndicates, doing undercover operations? And to find out more and to understand that, we have to understand what blast fishing really is. So fishermen construct their own explosives. They use urea, which is ammonium nitrate, and they mix it with fuel diesel oil. And they put it in a plastic container, like you see. Then, this is a pretty harmless mixture as is. So to make it explode, you need a high accelerant explosive. And the fishermen had access to Explogel V6 explosives. Now this is a mining explosive. So what the fishermen would do is they would grab a fuse, place it inside a detonator, and place the detonator inside the bottleneck of the explosive device. They'll strap a rock to it and throw it overboard and wait. It'll sink down to the reef a few seconds, huge explosion. And that explosion absolutely destroys the natural coral reef in every single way. It does so, it actually lays waste to the coral reef, which is the lifeline to the coastal communities of Tanzania. It literally creates a rubble field with no natural recourse of recovery, and certainly not in my life cycle. The fishermen then jump overboard and they swim down, or they get some scuba gear and they, they jump in the water and they go and collect their dead fish. The problem is a lot of the fishermen injure themselves because they don't know how to handle the dodgy detonators that they're using. They blow their arms off, they blow themselves up, and even when scuba diving, they don't understand the relationship between pressure and depth. So the guy on the bottom side of the screen has actually got decompression sickness. And I'm not sure if he's alive today. I really don't know. And that is the problem. These guys are killing themselves using these explosives. And there's not just one bomb. The hydrophone data from WWF showed 438 explosives in 46 days, that's just seagoing days, in Dar es Salaam area alone. And then the Wildlife Conservation Society of the Tanzania program, they took a ship and dragged a hydrophone along the length of the coastline to record whale songs. How beautiful. And what did they get? Hundreds of explosions <laughs> along the entire coastline of Tanzania. Then we have climate change illegal fishing, pollution, these are all having detrimental effects to the coral reef as we know it. And there will be a point sometime, and I think we're almost reaching it, where the coral reef is not going to support the growing, poor, and resource-dependent population of Tanzania. And that's a pretty scary thought. So J.D. Kotzer, an international um, investigation expert and ex-policeman from South Africa, and myself, a fish nerd, we were asked by the Indian Ocean Commission from the Smart Fish Program to go and investigate blast fishing in Tanzania and try and reduce it or eliminate it. And that was our mandate. It is not easy to catch a bomb fisherman. So we worked with the Ministry of Fisheries and we set up some strategic surveillance operations in Tanger in the north of Tanzania. And our results were, were less than convincing. We spent more time stuck in a tree on a random island being harassed by mosquitoes, pre-dawn, not a single fisherman rocking up. Then we decided to do raids on fishermen's houses at night, two o'clock in the morning. We went to the village elders, they pointed out where these bomb fishing houses were, and we went to raid and arrest the guys. Nothing, they had gone, even their furniture had gone. They didn't know we were coming, they knew that. 
We then went to the fish markets, and we did, we did a lot of operations in the fish markets, and we were thrown with rocks and stones and abuse and threatened, and it is a really difficult environment to try and combat blast fishing. So we changed our strategy. Let's go and capture all the illegal fishing gear and destroy it, including the boats. We had undercover officers in the villages marking the boats that are indicated as blast fishing boats, so we would just go and clean them out. And then we would burn and destroy the illegal fishing gear. And that was one of the, the challenges we were facing, but after two years, we had literally no success. So I sat there over a cold beer with JD, and I said, listen, what are we not getting? What are we missing? Something's wrong here, because quite frankly, we look like a bunch of Muppets, right? not achieving anything. About two months later, we had our break. We set up an operation in Matwara, but first, we set up an operation in Dar es Salaam, and we leaked information about what we were about to do. Fake news, it works, right? We told the fishermen exactly what they wanted to hear. So the patrol went out, nothing. We then snuck into a car and drove 700 kilometers south to Matwara, right? And then we got into a little patrol boat, pre-dawn through the mangroves, through the coral channel, and went to the deep sea and waited for the blast fishermen to come. It was a 36-hour day, but we managed to arrest three blast fishermen with nine kgs of explosives on their boat. From the information we obtained from them, we managed at two o'clock that Sunday morning to go and pick the explosives trader, the dealer, out of the village and arrest him as well. So for the first time, we had first-hand information and evidence on what was going on. Up until this point, all our operations were based on two key assumptions. The first is the bombs were made locally, used locally, and traded locally amongst fishermen. And the second was the sale of the fish from blast fishing incentivized blast fishing to continue. So does the profit margin. What we understood from the information from these gentlemen that we arrested was that we were completely wrong. So the first assumption the fishermen make the bombs is partly correct, but the urea explosive you saw earlier is just to add more bang to your bomb. And what really is interesting is that it's the trade in Explogel V6 that is driven by organized crime and mafia-type syndicates. We had completely overlooked the criminal aspect of what was happening in this trade. And by doing so, we were not climbing up that ladder to be able to stop blast fishing. The second assumption about the selling of the fish being profitable was completely false as well. It's actually the trade, the value of the trade in explosives along the chain that has the value. What we realized when I had a, had a beer with JD and a, we were like, what were we missing? What, what do we not understand? Is that we weren't looking at the bucket of fish the fishermen were bringing in from bomb fishing. It's literally worthless. A fisherman throwing a bomb is a measure of desperation. And he's been manipulated by the low level syndicate leaders, the boat owners, the local businessmen, and the local politicians at that level. So we had to revise our operations quite drastically. We had touched a nerve in Dar es Salaam, and we wanted to hand some of this information over to international media to try and create some publicity about it. Little did JD and I know that we were about to be arrested. So a bit of fortune and a bit of foresight from the Ministry of Fisheries, instead of getting arrested, we had a meeting with the Inspector General of Police of Tanzania, and we showed him our case. Look what we found, look what we've uncovered, You've got a criminal network dealing in explosives in your country. He immediately said to us, carry on, but use this team of officers that I'll give you, led by Mr. Juma Mahada, and go back and help and work on the investigation to prove your new assumptions. And these new assumptions were very simple. The trade in Explo Gel V6 has to come from a black market. And we assume that black market originates in Merirani Mining District which is a Tanzanite mines in Tanzania. The second assumption is super dealers are being used to trade the explosives up and down the coastline. Now, when you poke in the dark into something illegal and lucrative, eventually something pokes back. And what we found is that we were getting a lot of threats. We had to watch our back on most of our operations. 
Um, there were times where we were very worried about um, our safety. And that was just sort of part of the norm of what we were experiencing. And for me, coming from a world of fish scientists and now working in a world of fish crime, there's quite a lot to, to process and get through. You know, intimidation, fear, not only for me, but my family as well. My wife would phone, hey, what are you doing in Tanzania at the moment? Oh, working with Nemo and some measuring some fish. <laughs> not, nothing to do with bombs and mines and explosives. I promise everything's fine. And, and we had to work through that together as a team because it was intimidating. And we had to carry on because we needed to find the super dealer. So we headed to the mines, the Tanzanite mines. That's our team going down in some sort of bucket-like thing into the depths of the mine. Yeah, so we started doing random mine inspections so that the miners wouldn't get worried that there's an additional police force in the mining area. And what we found after about four or five days of the hottest, windiest, dustiest place in, in Africa was inside one mine, a little piece of paper, handwritten receipt for the selling or the sale of explosives from a non-registered dealer. Uh -huh. Maybe this was the source of the black market. And that's something we had to investigate. So we got two undercover officers and we set up a sting operation immediately. And the guys went in to this dealer and pretended to be fishermen from Atwara trying to extend their business opportunities. And they managed to buy 750 sticks of Explodel V6 from this guy. One stick can be broken down to make five kilograms of urea bomb. So theoretically, we stopped three and a half to 3.7 tons of explosives entering the coral reef by doing this purchase. We also learned from this guy how to maneuver the explosives on the road down to Dar es Salaam as to avoid police stops and roadblocks and how to get it to a super dealer. So we were right. Mararani was a version of the black market, all right? And super dealers were around in Dar es Salaam. So we were, we were correct in our assumptions. For the last three years, we had been working with the Ministry of Fisheries at this real low level of criminal activity, level one, level two, the local bomb fishermen and the local dealers. If you want to stop bomb fishing, you can't work there. You're not going to have any success. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a ruptured artery. It's just not going to work. But after a year of working with a small little unit with investigative powers into criminal activities in Tanzania, we started unraveling level three, level four, even level five transnational criminal syndicates, not only linked with explosives, but wildlife crime as well. And based on the success that we had uncovered and what we had shown, the Minister of Home Affairs and the government of Tanzania officially ratified and signed into a force the national task team, the MAT, a multi-agency task team of Tanzania. And we were really proud, and our duty was to investigate organized wildlife crime, of which fish crime was part of it. So here we are, we started a new agency in the police force with the Tanzanian government. And we have a blueprint on how to move forward and fight organized wildlife crime. The key success to the formation of the MAT, political will, and in Tanzania, we have it. So now we needed to get the intelligence on the super dealer. So we infiltrated the Dar es Salaam ferry fish market with lots of undercover agents and all the surrounding villages as well. And while we were doing that, we were running operations in Tanga in the north, as well as Matwara in the south. And during these operations, we managed to arrest more bomb fishers and more bomb dealers in Matwara. And from them, we managed to ascertain that the super dealer in Dar es Salaam had an alias, J4. Okay, J4 was now on our radar. When we corroborated that information with our intelligence officers, same name started coming up, J4. So now we had to find J4. So what we did is we set up a number of sting operations. And we went to buy more and more and more explosives, bigger quantities every single time. The simple reason we did this in the area where J4 was working is we were buying legitimacy with those low-end dealers that he obviously controls, and we're dangling this money carrot. There's more and more money available, hoping he would come out of the woodwork and present himself and deal straight up with us. And it happened. 
Our agents were there with the cameras on, and they were buying some explosives, and here comes this guy. It's J4. We've got him on camera now. He then said to our agents, listen, you deal with me directly. I don't trust these guys out of me. They're stealing my money. She said, J4, <laughs> no problem. We'll deal with you. <laughs> we'll do all our dealings with you, 100%. So this was our first opportunity to catch the super dealer. So we set up another sting operation. We wanted to buy 1,000 sticks of Explodel V6 and 50 kilograms of urea explosives. So we got our undercover agents ready. We put all the money in their bag. And then we got an iPhone and put that I lost my iPhone function on, threw it in his bag as well. Because the deal was going to go down in the townships and the outskirts of Dar es Salaam with derelict roads and sort of tattered houses and it's very difficult to find your way. We certainly didn't know. We infiltrated the area with plainclothes police officers in case there was a security risk that went down and we had an arrest vehicle on standby in close proximity of where our iPhone was telling us things were happening. And that's how we did it. That's the tools that we had. So we got to the area after a number of location changes. Obviously, they're scouting to see who's following us. Um, and they met J4 in a location in a pretty tight end part. And the cargo was being loaded into our agent's car. But at that exact point, our arrest vehicle couldn't get to them. So we're like, oh, we're going to lose J4. <laughs> what do we do? And at that moment, the agent, undercover agent, just had a brilliant idea. He's like, ooh. I'm suddenly suffering from a severe case of diarrhea. <laughs> you know that, that, that classic excuse, nah, it was the chicken again. Well, that's what he did. And Jay was like, oh, well, there's a toilet over here around the outhouse. And as the agent got into the toilet, he bent down and phoned our arrest vehicle, who was close by. And because he memorized the way in or where the buy was going to happen, he managed to guide the car in. A short chase ensued. It was a bit intense. And uh, finally, J4 was arrested. We got the super dealer in Dar es Salaam. Now, the mat work doesn't finish there. We continue following up leads on other dealers and how this links to international syndicates and how that links to wildlife crime. But the key part is to be prosecution-driven investigations, where the measure of success should be convictions. And in this case, the Tanzanian government must own that success if we want the political will to fight wildlife crime. So we continue. And for me as a fish nerd, I never ever thought I'd be working with a multi-agency task team on multiple levels and scales of, of fish crime. But I always learned in my life to look beyond my level of expertise and to share that knowledge openly and freely. And in the case of blast fishing, we had to look beyond the fact that it's illegal fishing, beyond the facade, and we had to uncover that criminal element, that criminal network, because that is fish crime. And fish crime is wildlife crime. And the only way to fight this is through a multi-agency task team format. It works. It's international best practice. In the fight against fish crime and wildlife crime, time is our limiting factor, not the potential of our collective resources. Thank you. <laughs>